Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Neil Clark, Extension Forester for Eastern Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about forest soils. But to start with the basics, um, we know that uh, forest oils are made up of um, mainly four basic components in different uh, combinations. And that would be the, the mineral element, the organic materials, uh, water and air. The mixture and the composition of those elements within that soil structure is uh, what adds to uh, its desirability and its uh, suitability for different operations and for different um, purposes such as growing uh, plants uh, for agriculture and, uh, and forest. So to start with, parent materials which are the uh, the mineral makeup of the soils, uh, which vary greatly um, from igneous rocks to sedimentary rocks to millennia of, of um, deposition of materials uh, beneath the sea before these plates push together, which form the Appalachian uh, Plateau also the Blue Ridge uh, and as it comes down through the through the Piedmont. So the state of Virginia has a vast diversity first of all of parent materials. Then we combine that with uh, quite an array of, of biological inputs and so that's what the forest uh, cover type contributes. Forested cover types um, cover 62% of these parent materials across Virginia. And so um, you'll see the dynamic of the forested cover type on different parent materials um, create the uh, almost 600 uh, different soil types that we have across the state. In general, forests are not located on the most prized soils um, as those typically have gone to higher land uses such as agriculture, uh, the flatter, deeper soils uh, where uh, machinery can operate and, um, um, and then have suitable characteristics for high yield of agricultural crops uh, typically are used for that purpose. And the trees are left to grow in uh, areas that are, that are either too rocky, too steep, or too wet uh, for uh, good agricultural production. I'm sure Alexandra is going to cover in her section uh, many things about the subsoil horizons. And uh, what I would like to touch on a little bit here uh, is the, the, the unique uh, horizon that the forest cover type brings is a, uh, a pretty significant development of this O horizon or the organic layer. Now this organic um, layers further classified into three uh, other layers and that would be the OI which is the the large material the large bark chunks of, of rotting wood leaves and um, animal carcasses uh, and things that are that are not broken down are part of the OI layer the next layer down and that would be what the foresters refer to as the litter layer then further down, we have a partial breakdown of these where you can see uh, small bits of roots, uh, pieces of leaves, and pieces of wood, uh, small pieces but not uh, uh, larger. So this is the fragmented layer, right? So uh, this is Duff. This is the OE layer. And then lastly, before you hit mineral soil, you'll have what's commonly referred to the humus or the or the organic soil layer uh, that really has no no identifying uh, structures anymore uh, related to uh, what they what their original uh, material was so in this uh, this layer uh, is really uh, fine and undefined but yet it still has that dark rich um, characteristic of uh, organic material and uh, primarily uh, a good bit of carbon. Uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the OA layer 
is usually around 10 to 1. You know, here we can see how the plant components of the forest, as in this down log, are combined with the faunal components of the forest, which are the bugs and critters that break these uh, materials down either above ground and also below ground in the roots. An acre of living topsoil typically contains about 900 pounds of earthworms, 2,400 pounds of fungi, 1,500 pounds of bacteria, 133 pounds of protozoans, and 893 pounds of arthropods. So you can see that there's a whole lot of life that happens below the ground. As these materials break down, here we have the litter layer, which turns into the duff layer as these earthworms and bugs and fungi start to eat away and deposit their waste into this area. It becomes then the duff layer, uh, which is where you can see small pieces of plant but they're, they're more broken up fragments of plant. And then you get into humus, which is where the, there's really no discernible uh, pieces of plant. It's all waste product and broken down uh, carbon uh, bits there. Um, and this is where the mineralization of some of those elements that were in the waste um, then start to cycle back. So, so nitrogen that was uptaken uh, into into the plant then comes back down uh, and is broken down and, and resides here then in this in this humus layer and then you get down into to the mineral soil which in this case is is uh, pretty dominantly sand so we've covered some on how uh, the nutrient cycle above the ground with the plants bringing uh, those materials uh, to the top. But then we think about what happens below the ground. And obviously we know that there are roots in the ground uh, at various depths. So you can see here a, uh, a larger root uh, that is deeper down in some areas of uh, the state. Well, we also know that roots don't usually go uh, so far into the ground. Uh, there's usually either um, a bedrock or a water table or just uh, certain uh, conditions that limit their uh, desirability uh, for being so deep in the ground. Nonetheless, we're talking uh, usually uh, a couple of feet in the ground anyway. And so these roots are down into the parent material uh, where obviously they're looking to uh, primarily to absorb water, but then they also uptake nutrients. And there are also <coughs> mycorrhizae elements that partner uh, with these rooting environments. And the mycorrhizae are, uh, are symbiotic fungi that really aid in uh, breakdown and nutrient uptake and, and cycling, as well as cation exchange. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, fungi of the phylum Glomerulomycota form the most common plant symbiosis known and are found in over 80% of vascular plants. Some are generalists while others exhibit host specific chemical attraction. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are characterized by the formation of arbuscles, which, and forgive my crude drawing, but are in the uh, plant cells within the cell walls. Um, the word arbuscle kind of uh, refers to this uh, tuft of um, mycelia here that um, really branches out when they get into the cell walls if you look at them under, under a microscope. So that's the term arbuscle. And um, they also form vesicles. So again, my crude drawing uh, in between the cells tend to be these vesicles or these little liquid filled storage sacks where um, nutrients and water 
uh, that they bring in from outside. So this is, they come in through the root hairs. And uh, basically these hyphae are the uh, fungal strands uh, essentially extend and form a, 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 as far as surface area, greatly expand the surface area um, of the plant structure. So basically these the cells of the hyphae are much smaller and uh, can go grab uh, these nutrients and water um, molecules from the soil. So uh, you notice my, my water droplets, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and also the little purple M's are uh, micronutrients. So um, they're actually responsible for grabbing a lot of these um, nutrients and actually bringing them uh, into the plant and then they facilitate the exchange uh, within the cells uh, with the arbuscles. These fungal hyphae have a very high surface to volume ratio making their absorptive ability greater than that of the plant roots and um, they're you know of course finer than the roots and can reach into the pores of the soil that are inaccessible to the roots. Up to 20% of the host plant's carbon may actually, so this is symbiosis, right? So they bring the nutrients in and then the, um, the fungi itself uh, gets a great amount of sugars and carbons from, um, from the plant. So the plant then transfers, can transfer up to 20% of its carbon um, back into uh, this mycorrhizal network. So that is uh, also responsible for a good amount of the um, soil carbon. Another concept of soil that we <clears throat> discuss in forestry often is bulk density. So a soil that is, uh, that is a heavy clay that has been compacted has very little room for air or water has an extremely high bulk density. The weight of that uh, material uh, within a certain volume is great, whereas <clears throat> the sandy soil will have a, a less bulk density. And up here, where you have a lot of uh, topsoil and organic material, uh, obviously your your bulk density there is is very low. So there are thresholds. Uh, vegetation tends to uh, do better in, in lower uh, bulk density situations. This introduces us to another term used in soil science known as bioturbation. Bioturbation is the soil movement and mixture by animals and plants. So we've already mentioned how significant plant and tree roots are in performing this function. But what about animals? Most obviously we think of earthworms in this role. The battle between native and introduced earthworms, uh, which are the common ones that you know and fish with, is interesting and perhaps a topic for a future installment. But maybe groundhogs and moles come to mind when you think of animals moving soil. What about crayfish in some areas? How about ants? The fact is, outside of roots and fungi, there are a multitude of animals which help till the soil. I hope you've enjoyed the information we've presented today and that will help you further appreciate all that goes on in Virginia's forest soils. Make sure you visit the Virginia Forest Landowner Education Program's YouTube page and this video will be on that page shortly and make sure you uh, hit like and subscribe there and tell your friends about it and that way you'll uh, know about more of these exciting videos coming forth such as weird trees presented next week by karen snape until then have a joy-filled journey